farming and water. Are we allies or enemies? Um, got a, a panel of four people today. Myself, um, Professor Jane Rickson uh, from Cranfield, Alistair Leggett from Affinity Water, and John Cherry's joining us. Uh, the idea, I'll just run through a quick presentation setting out the, the, the situation with the water environment in, uh, in England and Wales at the moment. Um, talk about some, some of the problems that it causes, possibly some of the, the reasons for it and what we can do about it. So what's wrong with water in the, in the UK lands landscape? Well, quite obviously we've been seeing a lot of floods. Um, there's a lot more emphasis becoming, uh, uh, people becoming aware of issues around drought. Uh, pollution is becoming a, a much bigger issue of the water environment. Uh, and one that a lot of people aren't aware of is threats to public water supply, the security of being able to keep the taps running. I'll go through how, how, we, get, how we got here. Um, is it the changing in the climate? Is it uh, down to agricultural drainage? Um, is it other practices? Um, there's an element of soil health in all this, and it's something that we all need to start to discuss and, and work out what's underlying these problems, and then what we can do about it from here on. So floods, well, they're pretty well self-explanatory. Flooding's a natural process. It's been going on for a for virtually forever, um, but flooding does seem to be getting more frequent. Uh, it impacts on the whole of society, not just on agriculture, but we feel it very strongly in agriculture. Um, two of these photos are local, one's further up country. Droughts, pretty much self-explanatory, but it does seem as though we're we're facing more problems with shortage of water in this country now than I remember in my lifetime. Uh, seeing soils in this sort of state is not as uncommon as it was. Um, and dried up riverbeds where, where we wouldn't expect to see them are becoming more common. Pollution. Pollution's, pollution from all sorts of sources is affecting our water environment these days. And agriculture comes in for a lot of stick for, for this. In many cases, it's, it's quite well deserved, the, uh, the attention that agriculture gets for, for pollution. And public water supply. This is the one that a lot of people aren't really aware of. Um, I'll very quickly run through. According to the, the EA, quite a large portion of England is actually water stressed. And very few people realise just how serious it is. The, the red area in the southeast is, is actually at some risk of um, failing to be able to keep the taps running in the short term, in the medium term. Uh, predictions are shortfalls out around about 2030 onwards, unless we do something to change what we're doing now. Oh, it's not just the southeast, though. Uh, here we have an example from Yorkshire Water predicting a, a shortfall in supply over the same sort of time scale. Um, down in Bournemouth, uh, Thames Water and um, Affinity Water. But e even places like Lancashire, a couple of years ago we saw very low reservoir levels and concerns about whether it was going to be possible to keep public supply going. The figures that we start talking about when we're into public supply very rapidly get quite alarming. Um, out around 2030 to 2050, for the southeast, we're starting to talk about total um, demand deficits in the region of um, five to 600 million liters a day. And that takes some finding. As a result of that, the water companies are starting to look at all sorts of different solutions. They're looking at piping water in from other catchments, um, some very, very expensive options. And 
agriculture can, has the opportunity to be part of the solution to this. It's, it's already commonplace for water to be traded between all the water companies, and a lot of people outside the industry don't appreciate that. But this is going to become a much bigger deal and to, to cost the industry huge amounts of money. So how did we get here? Well, we keep hearing about climate change. The climate definitely is changing. Um, this is Met Office data. Uh, changes in long-term changes in temperature, long-term trends in rainfall. Overall, the, the annual rainfall is increasing, but tending to fall in, great, in a smaller number of large events, which poses challenges for us as land managers, and it poses challenges for the rest of society in terms of managing flood risk and managing um, water resource. Complicated by the the rise in temperatures. Is it just that, though? I, I st first started thinking about this properly uh, about 13, 14 years ago. At the time, I was working for the Environment Agency, and I tended a, a village not far from here where a resident had phoned in and said that the, the river was blocked with reeds in summertime and could we do something about clearing it because there was a risk of flooding come the autumn. Got talking to this elderly resident, a woman in her 70s, and she pointed out in conversation that they used to swim in the river when she was a child. Well, for the whole of my life, that river's been dry every summer. And I thought, that can't be right. So then I started looking back at some of the historical records, and she was right. And not only that, a short distance away from her, at the downstream end of the village, there's a mill. No one in the 1800s would have built a mill on a river that was dry all summer. You just couldn't have justified the cost of that sort of investment. So something's really changed about the hydrology of some of these rivers. Could it be, first thought, my first thought was, well, I know huge areas of agricultural land were, were drained artificially after the Second World War as part of the Green Revolution to try and increase our food production. And if that drainage didn't change the rate at which water is taken off the farmland into the rivers, then why would we have done it in the first place? That was its whole purpose. So I, I was thinking to myself, well, it, drainage is clearly a large part of the answer. As an example of just how extreme some of that, that work was, uh, not far from the village I'm talking about, the, the black and white photo on the right-hand side there was the Lee Conservancy Catchment Board enlarging the River Quinn to cope with the additional drainage that was being put in. The, the little ditch here is the river they're enlarging, and the channel beyond it is what they turned it into. That's the sort of extreme measures that were being done routinely to improve agricultural drainage. Since then, I've, I've learned a lot more about soil health. And I've started looking at things from a rather different position. And these days when I look around myself, I, uh, around the area, I see a lot of these sort of things on our agricultural landscape. Now the, these photos were all taken very close to me, a few miles away from here, uh, the day after uh, eight millimetres of rain. That water had had about 14 hours to drain away, and yet it's still laying on the surface. Anywhere you go in the country, you can take pictures like this. This sort of management has become commonplace across agriculture. Um, we've all got so used to it that we don't see it as an issue anymore. And this one up here particularly highlights that this is soil blow going on in Scotland. What are we doing when there's soil blow happening in a, an environment like Scotland? And it's become so commonplace and so normal to us that we see comments like this from farmers. Um, we expect the, 
that will be flooding and soil erosion during rainfall. And then only a few weeks later, we're complaining that the ground's too dry. Well, surely the two are related. So what can we do about it as farmers? Well, investment is part of, of the answer, certainly. Um, the Agricultural Transition Plan talks about investment. Um, we all look to invest in our businesses. And, and investment doesn't have to be capital. Um, it could be training, it could be attending things like Groundswell and, and learning. We've got to, to be prepared to, to actually change the way we think about these things. Adaptation. This is going to be a, a big part of it. It's going to happen whether we adapt or not, but we can adapt to it and change what the, the way that the catchment responds. Some interesting work from King's College London. Um, and here, that Mark Mulligan's highlighting that the, um, there's actually the, the vast majority of the water, the fresh water in the British Isles is held in plant canopies and the soil. The capacity of the soil and the plant canopies massively exceeds floodplains, um, wetlands, other water bodies. So the potential is there if the soil is, is in the right state to massively reduce the issue with flooding and to, to massively increase the available water resource both for growing things from and for public supply. But it's about how we do it. Uh, that Mark Wilkinson from James Hutton Institute has been looking at some of the, the um, environmental activities undertaken on farms over, the re over recent years and, and th the effectiveness of them. One of the things they've found is that with buffer strips and um, interception ponds and things like that, in a lot of cases, they've been implemented in such a way that they're, they're not quite e as effective as they could be. And it's getting that detail right, that last bit, that could really make all the difference. There's a lot of talk about natural flood management now. The realisation has, has, um, has occurred that we can't afford to manage our floods just by throwing engineering measures at everything all the time and that we need to, to manage the, the flow of, of water through our catchments from the very start. There's, good, there's increasing evidence available now and examples around how best to do this. And we need to be engaging with that as land managers and thinking about how we manage our, the water in our environment as much as we think about the, the actual productivity of the environment. partnerships. Why would, we, why would we change the way we manage water in our agricultural environments? Well, for a start, if we can get the, the soil health right, if we can manage our water more conservatively, then we can go a long way towards breaking this cycle between floods and droughts. We can reduce runoff rates during floods, we can certainly reduce soil erosion, but also we can retain more water in the soils to make us much more resilient to drought conditions. Work from King's College is clearly demonstrating that it's possible for us to smooth out flood flows by improving the condition of the soil and the rate of infiltration. I have a friend, admittedly, down on the other side of the world in New Zealand who's personally taken this about as far as he can on grassland and in the space of five years of uh, appropriate management has taken his soil infiltration rates from something of the order of 15 millimetres an hour to in excess of 170 millimetres an hour. It sounds incredible but it can be done. So in summary, we are seeing more problems in the UK landscape with water. 
There's no doubt about that. We're seeing more droughts, more floods. We're certainly seeing more pollution. As to how we got here, well, it's management practices and climate change. We can alter one of those. We can't very easily alter the other. What, can we, what we can do about it as farmers, well, we're the people who actually manage something like three quarters of the land space of the country. Even if we only make small percentage changes to the way that water behaves in our landscape, we can actually make big differences in terms of the water availability, the efficiency of water use, and the, the risk of flooding and of soil erosion. And at that point, I'll ask the, the panel to come up and we can, uh, we can take that further. <laughs> yeah. Uh, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm Sorry, I'll be the singer. Yeah. Yeah. You, you say we'll do the dancing. Yeah. Yeah. I'll start start with Jane if I can. Sure. Um, I first heard heard Jane talk about this about four years ago, and it was a bit of a light bulb moment for me, hearing her talk about the the impact of soil health. Um, in a more broad sense, but from, from my particular background, I was thinking about it from water. So, um, what are your thoughts on it? So, a, a I've nicked something from a colleague of mine at Cranfield University, and I think it's as simple as the three R's as far as uh, the relationship between rainfall and soil. Uh, the three R's are, first of all, you have to have your ground in a position to receive rainfall. So that means basically that you cover the ground with vegetation as much as possible. So these extreme high intensity rainfall events, the energy of that rainfall is taken out by the vegetation. So it won't damage the soil. So that's the first to receive rainfall. The second is then to retain the rainfall. You need the soil structure in a position where it can retain and hold on to that water as best as possible, particularly during drought periods, during the summertime. And then the third R, so we've got receive, retain, and then the third R is release. You need, again, a soil structure that will help release that water when we get these high-intensity, high, intensity, high dura long duration rainfall <coughs> events. And, okay, that's all very well, but how, there's a contradiction there. How are we retaining water and releasing it at the same time? It's the same soil. And it's all about the structure and the pore sizes of those uh, channels between your aggregates of soil. You want large enough pores that will release that water, that will drain that water, and the small pores that through capillary action and tension hold on to that water during drought. So those are the three R's. Can I receive water safely? Can I retain it? And can I release it? And that is all about good soil health. Any observations? Yeah. I mean, I'm happy to go. I mean, I work for the, uh, the local water company in this area, and I've been uh, leading our catchment program for about 10 years now. Um, the catchment program was initially focused on investigating solutions to water quality problems such as nitrate pesticides in the catchments, so working with farmers. And I think one of the, the greatest eye-openers for me um, and actually it was you, Jane, was the rainfall simulator from the first groundswell I intended. And just that visual, and there is actually a demonstration at 11 o'clock in, in the main tent, so I'd encourage you all to, to kind of have a look, because it, it's stark, the differences between the way that the land is managed and the impacts on both runoff, but also, which was an eye opener for me, the changes to infiltration as well. So affinity water are dependent on about 60% of our total supply from groundwater. And really, our aquifers are our reservoirs. So we rely on winter rainfall to replenish our aquifers, our reservoirs, to, to kind of supply our population during the summer. And we're always two, really, two dry winters away from a drought. And it's always something that, that is, is heavy on our minds. And, uh, but seeing the changes to infiltration with the way good, you know, good soil health management, the reduction in runoff and the improvements of water quality really showed me that there are 
measures that can be done in the field that can really in, in, you know, improve both quality and quantity of water for a public water supply company. And it really opened my eyes up as a private business that rather than just focusing on our water treatment works, our boreholes, our, our mains in the ground as our primary assets, really the catchment is our primary asset and working with farmers, working with other institutions such as Cranfield, learning and understanding those, those subtle changes that can be made is really something that a water company and, and customers should be investing in. Yeah, I mean, we had 62 mil of rain here on Friday just when we were trying to set this show up. And the pleasing thing about it was, I mean, you're standing, I mean, this, this tent wasn't there then. This has gone up, so it's gone. This ground had 60 mil of rain and it all went in and it's incredibly pleasing. You can go and have a look over there. There's a, there's a soil pit and actually our soils, you've got so much topsoil, a certain amount of clay and, and then it's chalk underneath. And if we can get the, if we can get the water through the clay, which has always been a tricky bit, then it's, it's, it's recharging uh, your, your, water, your, your reservoir underneath. And, it, it, it's, and of course, all the chalk streams round about here, which, you know, this is a, this is a wonderful area for chalk streams, which have mostly been sucked dry by, well, you know, not, not <laughs> but it's, uh, <laughs> but, it's, but I mean, it's part, partly, it's partly, there's too many people sucking it out, but also it's partly that the, the water isn't, isn't soaking into the ground. And it's, and it's, 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 it's so obvious for every, I mean, it's, it's, you know, this is, I can bang on about this all day. I mean, it's in everybody's interest to get the soils right. And um, the more carbon we can suck into the soil, the more like a sponge it is, and it'll absorb the, it, it, it'll release it not just to the water companies, but also to our plants. Uh, you know, one gram of, of, of humus in the soil will hold five or seven grams of water. It's a fantastic resource to have, and, and if the healthy soil is, as you say as well, you've, you've got all the bacteria and the fungi, and they can extract the water from the clay where, where, where the plant roots can't, it's, 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 it's in, you know, it just makes farming so much easier. And John, John talked about over-abstraction, and th there is or has historically been a, a degree of that. Um, we all laughed, but it's, in this particular part of the country, we have the driest part of the country and we have the biggest population. Um, so yes, there is an inherent tension there. Um, we also have very high household consumption rates of water because it's an affluent part of the country. But that's not the whole issue by any means. Um, the, the approach that we've taken as farmers and landscape managers has been very much as, uh, as blinkered as that of the, the public approach to water. Um, our whole drive for a very long period of time following sort of the 1950s, 1960s has been about when it rains, how quickly can we get the water off the land? We've been all talking about artificial drainage. And then it shouldn't be a surprise, it really shouldn't, that a few weeks later, if we don't continue to get rain, we're all wondering why the ground's all dried out and we can't, we can't get anything to grow in it. Um, we really have to start to see our land differently. We have to manage it differently. Uh, it's, it's not the only answer, and it's going to take a while to do, but it, instead of continuing to perpetuate the, the, the negative cycle that we've been in now for the last 60 or 70 years, we're going to have to address this and start managing things differently to create a more virtuous cycle. I mean, if I can just add to that, I mean, as an outsider to the, uh, the agricultural sector looking in, I mean, I've, I've just found it incredible how, the, how this, the industry mobilized after World War II to, to kind of feed the population, to really, you know, build the level of agriculture, improve yields and, and the technology that goes into farming. And I think one thing I've learned is that the water industry really is, is the different side of the same coin. I mean, we've, we've had to improve our infrastructure to supply a growing population, particularly in this region. And uh, we've always looked for engineering solutions to those problems and in the same way agriculture has. And it's been, you know, it has really progressed us, but there are these unintended consequences around, you know, what's happened. And, and you know, we have the same issues with flood. You know, we have water quality problems when there's flood. We have, you know, we, we can't move the water out 
quick enough. We generally have the lowest demand during flood periods. So we, you know, we've had boreholes in this area going artesian in those conditions. So we have those challenges. Under drought, we, you know, when we have the highest demand, we can have boreholes virtually drying up because there's so much demand for water. And and then, you know, we have the same issues almost on the other side. And we've realized we've come to a point where those engineering solutions are not going to continue to work and actually we need to work more with nature go back to some of the techniques that we've used historically and this, this is both for agriculture and the water industry and you know we we now realize that the catchment's our first asset and and actually some of the things we've learned from the likes of, of john and, and through studies from cranfield we've realized that subtle changes to the to the landscape can really make a difference and you know where you've wanted to move water off the land as quickly as possible in this area during the winter, we want it held on there as long as possible so it will replenish our aquifers. But then when we've had that, we also get the issue with nitrates. So what we can do is we can find, and I think soil health and the way that the, the, the land is managed, you can find solutions in all of those. And, and really for us, although we've got to change the way we invest, we've got to change the way we look at our catchment, there's a lot of research, a lot to learn, particularly catchment specific, because every catchment behaves differently. But if we can find the right measure at the right place at the right time, we can really see those benefits. And some of our research is, is really starting to show that. And, and, and I think soil health is not only about agricultural production and water regulation. It's about things like biodiversity mm. as well. It's like um, climate change mitigation. And I think for that reason, soil delivers so much to society as a whole, mm. not just agriculture, not just the water companies, but actually every, you know, everybody sitting in this room, whatever you have for breakfast will, unless you had salmon, in which case you're too <laughs> posh, but anyway, but and if you think what you have for breakfast, 94% of our food comes from soil. So everybody is engaged, everybody in society is engaged, but the water regulation, the flooding that we see, the droughts that we see, again, we've got that fantastic reserve of that soil. It doesn't need to be that deep. Um, I think Ian showed that, that um, the storage capacity of soils in the UK, six, 65 cubic, cubic kilometers? kilometers. Yeah. Wow, that's big. That is the capacity for our soils to store that water and deliver all of these benefits to the whole of society, not just agriculture and the water companies. Another interesting angle to all this, um, agriculture at the moment is going through the biggest set of changes that it's faced, certainly since the end of the Second World War and probably a lot longer than that. We're all questioning how we're gonna remain viable. Um, and we're under pressure to, to produce food in the face of imports possibly produced to different standards. We're being asked to, to provide the, the public goods that DEFRA are, uh, are now aiming for with the, the new environmental schemes. Um, we're being held to account for a lot of what we do. Um, I, I feel very strongly that this is actually an opportunity for us in changing the way that we manage our land. Uh, the, the changes that actually achieve this improvement in the, the water cycle are the same changes which also happen to sequester carbon. They're, they're also changes which, as, as we've already been, been saying, offer benefits to the water companies. Um, if, if these changes create a, a reduced flood risk, or less soil erosion and problems for, the, for water courses from that point of view, then there's no good reason why there shouldn't be some flow of money into agriculture to reward those changes. And I can see a distinct possibility, if we can get this right over the next 10, maybe 15 years, for farms to finish up in a situation where they have a diverse income stream arising from their environmental management as much as from producing food. The, as a side effect of the way you're managing the farm, you would possibly qualify for incentive payments from water companies for reduction of pollution, um, but also for increased infiltration contributing towards their security of supply. There's no reason why there shouldn't be some mechanism to reward farmers for reduces in reducing flood risk. And the, the, the state spends huge sums of money every year on managing flood risk. 
if we can reverse some of the changes that we c created in the hydrology of our rivers and smooth some of these flood peaks out, then why shouldn't farmers be rewarded for that? I think that the, the future looks actually quite rosy if we address the issue and start working with it. Yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. And it, it's, um, I look forward to receiving all your checks. It's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, this is, it, this, this is the future. I mean, it, 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 it's so exciting. It, it's so much, it's, it, it's so easily achievable as well. It, it, it takes so many boxes. And it's, it's lovely if, you're a, if you've got a flood problem to build concrete walls through, the, through your city with, you know, to keep the river in. But actually, all you've got to do is sort out the catchment upstream. And it's, it's so much cheaper, and it's in everyone's interest anyway, because you're producing all these other benefits. It's, it's, it's yeah, anyway, I, yeah. I, Jane? I, I think the biggest challenge that we have is these changes don't occur overnight. You know, soil, it's very easy to degrade soil overnight, just like that in one event. It's much more difficult to build up soil health. It takes a long time. And the problem is many farmers and agribusinesses are on a much shorter planning horizon than they will get return on any investment. And it's trying to help and support farmers to take that long-term view rather than a short-term economic view which, frankly, you'll not get the return on that investment in the short term. I, 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 I don't know if that's true. Maybe that's not true. But I think this is what is putting a lot of farmers and, and agribusinesses off. That investment in the short term will get long-term rewards, but often the planning horizon, the economic planning horizon, is too short to see that return. And that's why I think the government should step in and incentivize farmers to take that uh, step in the short term so that we get these long-term rewards that benefit, and my point was, the whole of society, not just farmers, not just water companies, but the electorate who are actually going to vote in these politicians. So I, I think that's, I see we have seats reserved here for members They're from Death. Oh, well, they, okay, all right, <laughs> wonderful. Oh, hello, very good, excellent, sorry, sorry, wonderful. That's okay. I'm just going to say, and they haven't even turned up, so <laughs> <laughs> I do yes. apologize, I'm yes. very sorry, but I, I think this is the issue we have. Short-term planning, uh, in terms of the investment is needed, uh, is a one-stop uh, investment, but the return is long-term, and farmers often are working at the margins that they can't take that short-term investment. Um, and that's where I think certainly the ELMS is going to be very helpful in incentivizing farmers to take some of these measures, because it will take time to get that return on investment. I mean, it's exactly the same for the water industry. I mean, we work in relatively short investment planning cycles. That's usually driven by, you know, least cost, um, quickest solution, guarantee of risk, et cetera. Yeah. So we end up building our way out of problems. And, you know, as you, you showed on your slides, Ian, you know, some of those large transfer schemes, moving water from other areas, it's extremely expensive. It's very energy intensive. It's very carbon intensive. And as the water industry as, as every other industry is moving away from just economic investment we are looking at the ways we can reduce our carbon moving water from elsewhere is going to be extremely expensive it may be required in the short to medium term but over the long term if we can manage more sustainable supplies locally that's going to be much cheaper it's going to be much better for the environment and and really revert back to where we were and, and really from our perspective moving away from just looking at our investment from a monetary perspective but looking at wider natural capital looking at carbon looking at improving water quality protecting chalk streams which is very pertinent in our area that's going to if we start investing in those wider benefits and we start looking at the whole cost of that then our investment model is going to change massively and actually we'll probably get be able to invest in a lot more with less money and have a much longer and more sustainable success from it. So it's definitely a shift in our own direction for us. And I think it will, you know, we've got Elms coming in, but there's also the role for the private sector as well about how we align with Elms, how we complement Elms and how we really get the best deal for farmers and, and share the risk. Because we are ult ultimately all procuring the most valuable commodity from the environment, water. We need to share the risk. Soil. We need to 
and so well, soil. <laughs> yeah. So well, I know what it. Well, we're actually paying to remove a lot of soil from our yes, water, which yeah. is extremely expensive, energy intensive, carbon intensive. We don't really want to be removing that soil. We'd rather have lovely, clean water coming through that requires virtually no treatment at all. So if we can hold that soil on the land, if we can improve the health of it, if it can hold more water on the land, then it's a win-win-win. The wa water companies are already monetizing this. Um, Affinity has several projects running um, both on its own and in collaboration with Cambridge Water, uh, looking at reduction of pesticides in, uh, in agricultural landscapes. Um, Seven Trent Water has the STEPS program. Southwest Water has upstream thinking. Um, most of the water companies across the country, if not all, now have some sort of agriculture related scheme in which they are using private money to fund farmers to change the way they manage their land for the benefit of the water company. There's no reason why this couldn't become a significant part of farms' income streams to reward the, the changes that we're making. Yeah, I mean, we, we work with Affinity Water on growing cover crops, and it's a, um, uh, they've done experiments with, with local flag for looking at how much nitrates over winter cover crops will take up out of the soil, which otherwise would have got washed away and cost them an absolute fortune to try and get out of the soil, out of the water. But actually, of course, it's in the farmer's interest not to lose the blinking nitrates in the first place. We've had to pay good money to, to, to put them in the soil. We don't want them to wash away. Cover crops are fantastic. So, I mean, it, it, but it's a great pump time priming exercise. Mm. And um, to, to say, talk about Jane's point about the sort of economics of it, it it's um, you can talk to our accountant who's just opposite, land family business. He, he, he thought we'd go broke farming like this quite quickly and was quite surprised when we didn't. So, <laughs> and he's now running a kind of um, uh, uh, um, benchmarking exercise with 12 other farmers in the area who are all farming in this way and comparing it with hundreds of thousands of acres of conventional farmers in the same area. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically that financially it's no different. You know, I mean, some of our better people in our benchmarking groups are right in the top 10% of all farmers, and some like us are slightly lower down. So it's, it's uh, you know, we're, we're enthusiastic, but not particularly good at it. So you know, don't, don't say. <laughs> um, but it's a, um, it's it's it 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 just it, it does need a kind of pump priming. It's a pump priming exercise to to get people over the, the mental. Is 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 what the Australians, the New Zealanders talk about. You know, having a change in the top paddock. You know, it's in the brain. You've got to look at your farm in a different way. And the water, we, you know, we we tend to regard it as a bit of a menace. It doesn't come when you when you want it, and it comes when you don't. And it's it's incredibly valuable to to all society. And but it's it's also incredibly valuable to us. And we've, you know, we everything we should everything. You know, it, it it's very difficult being a farmer. You have to have to have all these different things. You've, skills being a vet and a mechanic and a you know agronomist and a you know people pleaser and everything a form filler crucially you know you have to do all these different things without worrying about the blinking water but it's absolutely crucial to everything we do this all really starts from a change of mindset though it's the mindset that we use in approaching our landscapes that's wrong and that's a very difficult thing to achieve on a on a wide scale um, I mean, the, by the very fact that you're here at Groundswell means that you're open to that. Um, we're a self-selecting group here, and so to a degree we're preaching to the converted. But um, we've got to learn to see these things differently and to change what we've done in the past if we want different, different outcomes. Uh, questions? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah? Yeah.
I mean, it's something I'm certainly interested in exploring in more detail. I mean, a part of our schemes at the moment, we've been trying to understand how we generate a market price for, for trading of ecosystem services primarily, how we can then deliver them on the ground on a larger scale. So in this area, last year, we incentivized over 800 hectares of cover crops. But the real question for us now is how we move that from 800 to 8,000 and beyond. So one of the, the questions that, that I'm trying to ask at the moment is how we bring other buyers into our market, because there are obviously other, other businesses, other sectors, the potential for this kind of investment to also you know, be investing in the same things that we're interested in, maybe different aspects of it, carbon. We might be interested in, in reducing nitrate or improving infiltration. So I'm really open to understanding how we can tap into such funding, how that can work over the longer term, what kind of um, limitations, what kind of opportunities there are. So nothing's off the table at the moment. One of the difficulties about all of this is going to be the whole issue about stacked funding. Um, the, the rules around agricultural payments in the past have very much uh, prevented multiple payments for the same actions. And with public money, that's, that's quite understandable. But we're starting to look at a system where the, the change in management practices delivers multiple benefits to multiple beneficiaries. And is there a good reason why those beneficiaries shouldn't all be paying for that benefit at the same time? That's what really unlocks the potential for huge sums of income to really reward and drive this sort of management change forward. And if anyone didn't hear, it's a question about how to actually go about monitoring the, these changes in order to be able to prove that they've taken place. I mean, I can, yeah, I can certainly come in on that. I mean, depending on, on what we're looking at, understanding, building the evidence for the case to invest in it is absolutely paramount, and monitoring is key to that. I mean, if we take the example of, of investing in cover crops to reduce nitrate leaching, which we've done here, now, we know we've got problems with um, groundwater nitrate. We also know that there is a bit of a lag period in the time that water takes to go through the aquifer. So a lot of the nitrate that we're removing is historic nitrate. So we've got that, that in initial challenge about, well, we're investing to solve a challenge further down the line, the increasing nitrate. But what we've, what we've done in this case is we've worked with the Farming Wildlife Advisory Group in the area to run cover crop trials. Actually, we've had some on, on John's farm alongside... This field, was in the, it was this field, wasn't <laughs> yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, I think the first one was. So, you know, so we've had those trials with the same mixes that we've, you know, we're keen to invest in through the catchment trading. We've had porous pots in the ground measuring the um, amount of what, the reduction in nutrients compared to a control plot. And we've done that for a number of years. Now, it's maybe not the most robust scientific study, but what it does is it provides evidence and data in a local context, which is absolutely key. There's no point us using research data from, from the Lake District or somewhere like that. It's not going to be relevant to us here. We want to understand what's happening locally. And that really then gives me the business case internally and to request through our regulators to funding to actually deliver these measures on the ground. We would do the same with pesticides and other contaminants. But also now we're looking at improvements to infiltration. Um, changes to earthworm populations, improvements to biodiversity over that, that winter period when cover crops are in the ground. So what we want to do is we want to start not just look at the water quality, we want to put numbers against everything because then that really will help us look at a whole costed investment. Okay. And, and I, th I think there's a big debate at the moment between uh, metrics versus practices. And uh, certainly in my area, in soils, um, is it about soil properties and how they change as a result of these different practices, or is it the practice themselves? And of course, the issue there, just, just as Alistair has picked up, you can't really compare two farms, especially if they're geographically um, separate. So I think it's about the transition of that particular farm over time. 
So, for example, if they have high organic matter levels already, it's very difficult to keep going upwards infinitely. Whereas if you've got low organic matter to start with, then, then you can see the, the trajectory of where that organic matter is going. So I'm not going to get too hung up about absolute values of metrics of soil health, for example. It's about that individual farm and how that is doing over time as a result of the practices. If I was really pushed, I think it is about the practices that are actually taken on board because of the complication of the metrics. What do you measure? I mean, to be honest with you, there is as many soil health metrics as there are soil scientists. And there aren't that many of those anyway. But anyway, but there are a lot of soil metrics. And uh, as I say, the problem is people get hung over, well, have you got 4%, have you got 6%, whatever. It's how you're mo moving over time that is the really important thing. I, as I say, I think it's about the practices and understanding that not all farmers can use all the practices everywhere. Different soils require different, some people cover crops are not the solution. I think John would accept that. Yeah. But in many places where you could use cover crops currently, they're not being used. But I appreciate it's not a one size fits all, which makes it very, very complicated from a policy point of view. I would also just throw the point in that, um, that an awful lot of the discussion in this sort of arena and the, the focus is about arable agriculture. In fact, all of these same issues apply just as much to grassland. It's the same problems are occurring on grassland. The same potential for improvements is there with grassland. In fact, if anything, changes in management can achieve um, significant changes in landscape behavior very very much quicker on some grassland um, so it, we need to be a bit careful about that but the, the the vast bulk of the work has tended to be uh, looking at arable agriculture and we're, we're missing a bit of a trick on on grassland fair comment or yeah absolutely I mean there are, you know, people often say you know I've got permanent pasture it's not a problem on my land but I I've seen some really dreadful Water, what, well, what, you know, sh flood water sheeting off permanent pasture, which blinking will ought to have so soaked in, and grown the grown the grass, and it's a, um, um, yeah, it it it, it 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 it's it's so easy to get it right, and it's and it's so beneficial for your livestock as well if you, if you've got a good healthy mixed pasture and, and you graze it properly and get your soil soil right. So. Yes. question is uh, is the potential for planned grazing to to help water retention um, do you want to say anything well, I mean it, it 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 really does I mean uh, it well Ian, Ian, <laughs> Ian's found that this year haven't you, you yes on your farm, yeah it's, uh, yeah um, we uh, my experience so far is only anecdotal because I'm only just starting to to measure infiltration rates on our place we've been operating planned holistic grazing now for for about four years. Um, I'm definitely seeing changes in uh, the biology of the land. I'm certainly seeing a lot more insect activity. Um, I'm seeing uh, species of plant that I've never seen before and that I didn't put there. Um, I'm also looking at plants that I've, I've looked at in the past as weeds rather differently. Uh, yesterday my cattle were grazing nettles at the side of the field quite happily um, and gaining nutrition from it but the potential is there as I mean the the figures I quoted there from Pete Blair down in Awaka in New Zealand he's purely grassland and he's he's achieved huge differences in the space of five years by really focusing on how his management of his livestock is affecting the, the soil and the infiltration rates and the, the soil carbon, um, rather than focusing specifically on the, on the livestock. So it has huge potential. Um, again, it's this thing about change of mindset. When you first start trying to explain to a, a livestock farmer about um, bunching animals up, keeping them tight, um, feeding them for short periods of time on an area of land and then giving it a long rest, the first reaction you get is, well, I'll spend all my time fencing and moving them. But once you actually get your head round it, I'll be going home five o'clock tonight to, to have something to eat and to move my cattle. 
moving the cattle, it will take me longer to walk to the field than it will to move them. It's just about getting your, your infrastructure right, and then it becomes very straightforward. And when you then think that I haven't put fertiliser on uh, all but one field this year, uh, I used very little last year, and in the long, t long run, I aim to use n no fertiliser at all. I haven't put a wormer on my cattle for four years, and their, um, their worm counts are extremely low. Uh, all of those sort of knock-on effects. So I'm not spending time driving around putting fertiliser on and bringing the cattle in to do these jobs, that sort of thing. You've got to take that off the other end when you think about how much time it takes. There's definitely potential there for it. It's just people learning the techniques. Well, yeah, good point about the fact that it's much quicker and easier to check them because they're all in a, in a small space. Uh, it's, it's also very easy to pick up, even in quite, quite large herds, when you move them every day and they're keen to move and they move easily. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure John will comment on that. Um, that when you move the fence and they all go straight away, you very quickly see if there's an animal that's lame or an animal that's hanging back or anything like that. Whereas if they're set stocked, you have to stand stand there for ages before you notice things like that. Oh yeah, I mean it, it's a, yeah, I love it. I love it. moving <laughs> cattle all the time. <laughs> it, it's um, and it, it's transformed. It's transformed the grass on this land, and certainly the, the quality of the soil and the water infiltration, and everything else. And it really doesn't take long it, if you're around it. I can't remember what time it's booked. It happens six o'clock. I think we'll be moving the mob down the other side of the, the wood here, and it's um. um it strikes me as a pretty poor entertainment, but people seem to enjoy <laughs> it. But it, it is just so, um, it's just so fantastic. It, it, it's getting the, it's, it, it's, it's working with mother nature. It could be, this is, this is how grazing animals should be, we bunched up, surrounded by lions, and, and moving all the time onto fresh grass. We can squeeze another couple of questions in before we, um, I'll take one at the back. <laughs> uh, I mean, they let a bit of the pump our river dry. A bit of the have actually been quite good in the last couple of years about coming up with a plan. They let Anglian water last Friday sent a massive slope of sewage down our entire big short river. Um, they are working against. <laughs> I have to say that given that I worked for them for 23 years, although, al although I worked in flood risk management um, as alongside farming, um, I can see things from both sides there. There are certainly issues at the moment in how we manage the environment and how we regulate it, uh, but I'm well aware that the Environment Agency have so many conflicting demands on them at the moment that they're in an impossible position whatever they do. Now they're clearly not getting it right and I think an awful lot of environment agency staff would admit that they're not getting it right but it's not necessarily because they don't want to. Um, without having someone here to represent the environment agency on the stage we can't really, I don't think we can probably say much more than that but it's the position they're in is a pretty poisonous one. I mean, I would just add that I work very closely on the ground with a number of them, environment agency team, and they're, they're committed, passionate environmentalists like I am. But we are all facing challenges, and, and really the key is, is, is continual dialogue and making sure we're all actually working to the right solution, and that, that those solutions are evidence-based, and they're not done by popularity or, or pressure, that actually we've got the right level of information and evidence to right, make the right decisions that, that make that case Irrefutable. Sorry. Uh, we, I, I'm in Warwickshire between the 8.5 and 10.2. We work with 721 a lot. We get grants from uh, Cross Green, we get money from GPS, uh, and we've probably got a uh, discount on uh, Ferret Phosphate to ship away from the Caroline, which is the main one in 2022. Um, would there be a way? 
Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Uh, I, I mean, we do work as close as we can with the agrochem sector. Um, I do a lot of work through Water UK, liaising on the national level and, and trying to influence kind of direction and policy. The cost, the prices, the economics of these things are always regarded. See, obviously, it's a competitive market. It's always been a bit of a mystery for us, but but we do feel that the ag chem sector and, and the, the suppliers, the commercial businesses, do need to come together and do a little bit more to support farmers, to support these kind of initiatives. I mean, one of the areas I'm particularly keen to see is we we a lot of water companies fund pesticide amnesties to remove, take away unwanted, banned on pesticides because there's an incentive for us for moving the risk from the catchment also it's a great tool for engagement with farmers but it does make me think well why is there not a take back scheme in the same way you have under the the weed regulations the waste electrical regulations there seems to be a gap here and, and I'm, i would question why the industry hasn't come up with something around that so i absolutely agree we are always keen to work with farmers we're always keen to work with suppliers we've done a lot of work with the metaldehyde stewardship group around finding kind of you know solutions to this so the product could remain obviously there were other issues there we'll continue to do that you know we just need to use products sustainably and they need to be at a fair price so we make them you know farmers can make the right decision based on economics as well as being the right thing to do I'm, oh, sorry. so I'm, I'm very conscious of time and the fact that in a few minutes the rainfall simulator is uh, is due uh, and that Jane at least is is due up there so I, I think I'll <laughs> I think I'll I think I'll draw it to a close there um, but I, I just just want to sum up by saying yes there are definitely problems that we've got with the the way we've managed the water environment in the past not all of them are created by us but some of them have been created by agricultural management in the past and there are definitely things that we can do differently in the future that will provide benefits to wider society benefits to us um, meet some of the, the aims of government and meet the aims of private businesses for which there's no reason why we shouldn't be being paid. So thank you for listening and if anyone has anything else to, any other questions then I'm sure we're all quite happy to chat to people later on in the day. Yeah.